Hello, my name is Logan Chipkin, and you're listening to the Fallible Animals Podcast. Last episode, we introduced and motivated constructor theory, which is our deepest theory in physics, and in my opinion, the first ever theory of everything. Today, I thought we'd continue our introduction into the theory by discussing the conceptual tools that are used by the theory. So all of our best theories employ particular conceptual or theoretical tools in order to explain the relevant phenomena. For example, the neo-Darwinian synthesis in explaining the biosphere employs concepts such as genes and natural selection and mutation and organisms, and many more. Newton's theory of classical mechanics also employs tools such as momentum and force and uh, gravity, and so on. So today I'd like to introduce the conceptual tools that are used by constructor theory. These include the constructor, things called substrates, tasks, and attributes. And we'll use a few examples to introduce these concepts. Imagine you had a frappuccino machine, or latte machine, or something like that. Any sort of machine that outputs a particular beverage given the proper input. So for example, let's say you have a frappuccino machine and you provide it with coffee beans and milk. Let's say you dump it in the top or however these machines work. I drink black coffee myself, so I don't really know. But anyway, once you give the frappuccino machine the coffee beans and milk, it'll output the frappuccino drink. So in this example, the frappuccino machine is a constructor. That is, it takes input, which in this case is coffee beans and milk, and it delivers an output, which in this case is a frappuccino drink. Also, and importantly, this frappuccino machine is capable of repeating this process or causing more than one of these transformations of raw materials to a final beverage. The frappuccino machine retains its ability to create a frappuccino, given coffee beans and milk, even after it causes one such transformation. And so a constructor is defined as any entity that can cause a particular transformation of input to output and retains its ability to do so. To take a more fundamental example, and one that David Deutsch talks about in his foundational paper, the link to which will be provided in the show notes page, Consider a chemical catalyst. If you have two molecules, A and B, it may be that they would only chemically combine in the presence of a catalyst. So here, the catalyst may cause chemicals A and B to form a final chemical, C. This catalyst must retain its ability to cause another such transformation, even after the first one. Another way of thinking about this that might be a little simpler is that During the transformation that the catalyst causes, the catalyst does not undergo any transformation itself, but rather only causes the transformation of the inputs. And so a constructor does not undergo any change during a transformation. It only causes the transformation of something else, which we've been calling the input, into something else, which we've been calling the output. So you can really think of any constructor as just a generalized version of a chemical catalyst. Once again, to reiterate, and I know I'm repeating myself, but some of these ideas might be new to some of you, so I figured it's worth it. A constructor is any entity that causes a transformation from some input to some output while retaining its ability to cause another such transformation again. Now, the thing that's presented to the constructor, so back to our Frappuccino example, This would be the coffee beans and the milk. This is what David Deutsch calls the input substrate. And the output, which would be the frappuccino drink, would be the output substrate. So the substrate is the thing that's being transformed. We could also ignore the difference between input and output and just talk about a substrate if we think of whatever the input is to be the same substrate as whatever the output is but with different attributes of that substrate being changed. So for example, we could also just think of the Frappuccino machine, which again is a constructor, as taking in a substrate of coffee beans and milk and transforming that substrate 
into a different form of just a frappuccino drink. So constructor theory is all about explaining which transformations of which substrates are possible and which are impossible. Another concept in constructor theory is that of an attribute. This roughly corresponds with the colloquial definition of the word attribute, and it's basically the thing about a substrate that's being transformed in a particular transformation. So for example, if you have an apple cutting machine such that you present it with an apple, so the apple is our substrate and the apple cutting machine is our constructor, this apple cutting machine reliably cuts the apple into six pieces. And so the attribute of the apple that's changing in this transformation is the number of pieces of the apple. And so the input substrate is the apple, which is only consisting of one piece, and then it undergoes a transformation in the apple cutting machine to become an apple of six pieces. So the attribute that's being changed, once again, is the number of apple pieces. Another example would be if you had a machine that, let's say, faced with an empty water bottle and a reservoir of water, it automatically fills the empty water bottle until it has two grams of water in it. Probably there are such machines or similar machines in many factories around the world. But in any case, here we have essentially two input substrates, the water reservoir and the empty water bottle, and the machine transforms them in a few different ways, but one of which is it changes their attribute of mass, by which I mean because the water reservoir's mass decreases by 2 grams and the water bottle's mass increases by 2 grams because water is transferred from the pool of water into the water bottle, we can say that the attribute of mass is transformed under this transformation. And finally, these things I keep calling transformations are really just called tasks in constructor theory. And so finally, constructor theory we can understand as explaining what tasks are possible and which are impossible and why. So to summarize, in constructor theory, a constructor, when faced with a particular substrate, causes a transformation of that substrate, which means at least one of the substrate's attributes is changed. This entire process of having a substrate change at least one of its attributes is called a task. And constructor theory is all about expressing the laws of physics in terms of which tasks are possible and which are impossible and why. Now that we understand constructor theory in a little bit more detail, let's review some of the philosophical problems that it immediately solves. One is the problem of causation. As David Deutsch writes in the foundational paper of constructor theory, the philosopher David Hume in 1739 argued that we can never observe causation, and so can never find evidence that causation is real. Now, if you listened to the previous episodes in which we talk about critical rationalism and how the scientific method really works, you can probably detect at least one or many errors in that thinking. But in any case, Constructor theory immediately solves this conundrum by showing that if causation is to mean anything, then surely it means which tasks are possible and which are impossible in the presence of some constructor. In other words, a constructor causes a transformation to occur. Constructor theory is incompatible with the assertion that science is a collection of facts or a vast set of data points. You'll never observe an impossible task, almost by definition. It literally can't happen. And yet, such impossible tasks, or transformations, are implicated as fundamental in our deepest theory in physics. Another philosophical problem that's immediately solved in constructive theory is to define exactly what knowledge is. We've actually hinted at this in previous episodes, but now we can say exactly what knowledge is with our understanding of constructor theory. So if you think back to Copernicus's heliocentric theory, that is, that the Earth revolved around the Sun and not vice versa, that theory has survived all sorts of criticism and errors in recording and transmitting this information 
and everything else. It survived for centuries at this point. And as I said in a previous episode, this heliocentric model is not confined to the history books, but rather confined to the science textbooks. And so this is information that travels from brains to paper to audio podcasts and so on to all sorts of uh, media that have information in them. Now, remember the definition of a constructor. It is anything that can cause a particular transformation and retains its ability to do so again. Now, this information about the heliocentric theory is really the only thing that survives all of its transformations. Copernicus certainly isn't around anymore, and the people who are transmitting this information come and go, so they can't count as the constructors. And even the other information carrying media that the theory is transmitted to are temporary. The books that once held the theory may not be around anymore, and even the podcasts that talk about them could be extinguished at any time. But the knowledge of this theory survives. So we can elegantly define knowledge now as a constructor. Throughout all of the millions or probably billions of transformations of blank pieces of paper and brains that haven't heard of the theory into pieces of paper with the theory written down and brains that now contain knowledge of the theory, the only thing that remains consistent or constant is the theory itself. So this information is knowledge, that is, information that causes its own construction. So knowledge is a constructor that, once instantiated, tends to cause itself to remain so. Because another special thing about knowledge is that not only is it a constructor, but the substrate is some entity that's capable of holding the information, such as a blank book or a mind, and the output substrate is the book or the mind with the information in it. Now, when you think about all of the possible tasks or transformations that can possibly occur, you quickly realize that the vast majority of these tasks do not occur spontaneously in nature. Spontaneously, by the way, can be thought to mean in the absence of a constructor. So while here on Earth, things have been created such as cars and hospitals and frappuccino machines, none of these things really occur in nature spontaneously. In fact, seen in this light, most of the universe is kind of boring. Sure, we have black holes and stars and planets and solar systems and all these things, but these compose an infinitesimally small fraction of all of the possible things that can be created. Most of the things that can be created, or transformed from other things, only occur in the presence of knowledge. So for example, a car is typically only created or transformed from metals and other materials that a car requires when a person with the knowledge of how to create that car is present. So while a reductionist framework would insist that particles and space-time and quantum wave functions are fundamental, and indeed they are, in a constructor-theoretic understanding, it is impossible to avoid the fundamental role that knowledge plays in our understanding of reality. And by the way, we can then ask, well, okay, but what is the entity that can hold knowledge or can create new knowledge? And the answer to that is people. But I think we'll hold off on that point for another episode. I was going to go into some of the scientific problems that constructor theory has already solved and some further problems that seem like constructor theory is capable of solving, but as seems to be a habit lately, I think I'm going to stop because I've probably given you enough to chew on, but I'd be happy to continue constructor theory in another episode. Now I do want to talk a little bit about a so-called universal constructor. So if we think once again about all of the possible transformations that can be caused in accordance with the laws of physics, constructor theory allows us to ask, is it possible in principle to build a machine such that it is capable of causing any conceivable and possible transformation? This device would be the ultimate technology, at least I think. In other words, you could present this machine with any input substrate and it would output any possible output substrate given the laws of physics. 
As far as I know, there's no law of physics that forbids the creation of such a machine, and so one research program for either constructor theory or some other theory would be to show how such a machine could be built and why it's possible. All right, I think that's enough for now. Next time, I think I'd like to get into David Deutsch's so-called momentous dichotomy that also emerges naturally from constructor theory. I'd like to get into the difference between laws and principles that constructor theory elucidates very elegantly. And I'd like to talk about the problems in science that constructor theory has already solved in the domains of information theory and biology. Thank you very much for listening to the Fallible Animals podcast. My name is Logan Chipkin, and you can follow me on Twitter at ChipkinLogan, and find some of my previous articles at www.loganchipkin.com. If you enjoy this podcast, please consider sharing with friends. I look forward to getting these ideas out there. Thank you and have a great rest of your day.